So Jim, what can you tell me about the black birch on your property? Oh, black birch is one of the coolest trees you could ever ask for. It's a uh, genus Betula, like the white birch, but this is Betula lenta. And it's got the same lenticels as the white birch, but um, this species has the largest sugar content of all the birch species. So frequently, you know, you'll, you'll have people tap these for the sugars. They'll make syrup. They'll make uh, real birch beer, not soda birch beer, and birch wine and birch spirits are, are my favorite. But I've, I've watched these trees grow on the mountain since 1966 as a young boy when I was seven. And uh, it's an even age stand that used to be a hemlock forest. And with all the scarification of the soil from the hemlock logging, with the, the mule teams they had and the horses logging out of here, it scarified all the soil and it offered opportunity for the little seedlings to come up. It gave them an opportunity to seed. But it's a, it's a great species and it's a, it's a great conservation tree. It's a pioneer species. It'll come in here and seed itself prolifically and, um, and really hold the soil in place. A real characteristic of this species is uh, you, you break off a twig like this. Ian, what do you smell and, and what do you taste? Wintergreen. Yeah, well years ago they used to make uh, wintergreen extract for perfumes in New York City from these mountains. Now how do our black birch differ from our, our white bark birch, the ornamental birches that we're coming across in the, in the urban landscape? Well, the color of the bark first. You know, you've got the pure white, uh, white birch that we've, that we've uh, also seen. This is more of a metallic gray-black, and that's why it's called black birch. So um, they both have the lenticels, though. That's a genetic uh, characteristic. They both have the same fruiting structure, and that's why they're both in the same genus as, you know, Betula. Mm -hmm. This species is tolerant of both acidic and, and alkaline soils. This soil, this specific soil is very alkaline. This is a limestone substrate, some sandstone, but mostly uh, limestone. And uh, like I said before, there was enough organic material from the old hemlock forest, the duff layer of the hemlock forest, when it was disturbed, it was a perfect seed bed for the little, little birch seedlings. That particular year, um, that they logged this area. So this one is really interesting because there was actually a nurse stump, an old hemlock stump, where three seedlings grew. A lot of times when you see trees like this in the, in the open, um, the tree was cut and these are stump sprouts. Well, in this particular situation, these are three seedlings that grew together. So it's very unusual to see that, but you can see the old hemlock <clears throat> organic material that grew on. Hemlock, it takes a long time for hemlock to decay. And thank God for the, the black birch or the sweet birch because it gives it uh, enough organic material for optimal growing conditions. Between that and the limestone substrate, perfect, perfect uh, growing conditions for black birch. So Jim, being a Pennsylvania native, are there any insect and disease issues we should be concerned about with black birch? Oh, I'm really glad you asked me that question. Um, that is another really cool uh, trait of black birch or sweet birch. I don't know of any insects or disease that attack it. And it could be because of the, the wintergreen nature of the, the sap, but um, you know, it, it's very resilient and I've never seen uh, a black birch predisposed to any insect or diseases, especially in this habitat. You know, as long as you have a, a decent soil or a duff layer, where there's enough organic material to sustain the growth, you know, the optimum growing conditions of the birch. Uh, there's really no predisposition to uh, insects and disease. And a lot of times with any kind of tree species, you know, when they really get hit by an insect disease, it's because they're predisposed, they're under stress. And these trees certainly are very, very healthy. Do we typically see any structural trends with this family of trees? Uh, from a structure standpoint, it is a well-balanced tree in the open area, in an open grown area. It's a nice tree because it doesn't get a lot of insects or disease and they prune structurally extremely well. Because of this healing, because of the collis wound tissue, the, the wounds close very rapidly 
And uh, so it's a great tree to work with in the urban landscape. If you were to take a seedling off the mountainside here, you'd want to replicate a lot of organic material and probably use dolomitic lime that has a lot of magnesium. They're, they're kind of an obligate for magnesium as they get older, uh, which is just Epsom salt. Yeah. You, know, you, don't want to, you don't want to use a lot of Epsom salt, yeah. just a small amount. Jim, what kind of maintenance is required with these black birch? Well, you know, in a natural environment like this on the mountain, there isn't a lot of maintenance. It's more for recreational purposes. And uh, I don't want to lose any of these trees. So, you know, alleviating the trees that are along an edge like this that are searching for sun, there's an, over, an overabundance of overextended weight toward the opening for sunlight. So I like to, to prune uh, the weight on the, uh, the meadow sides and that, that helps the tree to rebalance and stay structurally sound and upright so they don't get wind thrown during a storm uh, because of the additional weight. So the other, the other um, uh, added benefit, I, I can think of two immediately. One, it creates an opportunity for more vantage to the valley and the other mountain across the valley. So let's, let's, prune, this, um, let's prune this one limb if we could and you'll start to see the the vista open up. Perfect, look at that. See, a little bit of weight and the, the, the actual lateral branch bounces right up and uh, really helps the, the tree to, uh, to stay stable on the, on the mountainside. And the, the other uh, benefit, you can chop these up and uh, carry them down to the house and make birch tea today, which would be kind of fun to do. Um, that wintergreen essence, it's kind of an herbal, herbal tea. And, uh, and so I like to do that. I don't like to waste anything. So that'll be probably a, a good month's worth of tea. All you have to do is, is uh, you know, remove the leaves and chop these up a little bit more into, into segments like this and uh, boil them and strain them. You could add a little honey if you'd like. Makes a great tea. So it's a very unique species. We're very fortunate, Ian, to have this on the mountain and I've been fortunate my whole life to uh, have grown up with it and uh, see observe, you know, how this species grows.